Hello and welcome to the, a very special episode of the Peter Mackay Motorsport Podcast because today I have Swiss driver Rachel Fry, uh, the 2019 Nürburgring 24 hour SPA class winner, an 18 time race winner and Audi factory driver. Rachel, welcome to the programme. Hi everyone and thanks Peter for having me. Oh, thank you very much for making the time. Now, tell us a little bit about how you got started in racing. So, first of all, uh, it seems that you are really well prepared. Um, <laughs> definitely better than me. But, um, yeah, I will tell you a little bit more about myself and how I get started. So, um, actually, we grew up around cars because as a family business, we run a car dealership back home in Switzerland. And, um, yeah, that's, our dad was always a big motorsport fan. That's uh, why we started um, with go-karting a little bit, just as a hobby first. And then we um, started doing some, some races. And, uh, yeah, this, uh, got, and it got a passion quite quickly because I was somehow fast from the beginning on. I loved um, um, being in this little go-kart. So speed was really fascinating uh, on that time, or still is. That's how I get involved into motor racing. And then um, we just kept on going. We always uh, tried to, to find uh, the money, the sponsorship. And um, yeah, thanks to the, the car dealership back home, we could uh, use um, some contacts at the beginning, which helped a lot. But um, yeah, as you know, getting a pro in motorsport is quite a long, long way. It's a hard way, but finally I somehow made it. And um, yeah, luckily I'm I'm still in the motor business at at uh, this stage. Yes. And of course, you, you had a quite quite a similar path to many sports car drivers, as you know, you mainly specialise in sports car racing now. But it all got started off in really in the single seater category. Was there how what is it like for a driver when you're in the single seater categories and you're trying to make the way up, but it's such a demand on the finance? When do you? When did you make the decision to think, okay, I maybe need to take a different a different approach? Yes, unfortunately, uh, in motorsport, in the end, everything is about money. Um, when you start in, in go-karting, um, you dream to become the next Formula One driver. I think everybody <laughs> did. I did as well. Um, this is our, uh, our motivation. But um, yeah, then you start uh, doing single-seaters. You somehow find the money. I mean, I had also some seasons... Um, where I was only able to do three races, then I had to stop because I, I just missed the foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think everybody, everyone has really hard times. It's just a question um, then how you, how you plan um, your next step. And I just realized, okay, I will never find the money to do something big, to do the international Formula 3. I was only able to do the German um to do the German championship in F3. Luckily, I won races there. I was uh, always fast in single-seaters because for me still, um, single-seaters, it's, it's the best car you can do. I, I love it. It's really, um, it's, uh, it's reactive, it's fast, it's, it's amazing. So, um, but yeah, at the, um, at the stage of Formula 3 doing this German championship, I realized, okay, I will never find uh, the money to do something bigger. Um, let's try to find um, other solutions. Let's try to contact um, GT teams, uh, to contact GT manufacturers. And um, I was lucky because at that stage, um, there was a change within the DTM team at, uh, at Audi. And uh, then I got the possibility to do a DTM test. And that's why I got involved uh, into the DTM program with Audi. And uh, since then, I uh, I stayed with Audi. Yeah. And you, you've been you've been an Audi driver now for is it ten years now? You've been an Audi driver. Yeah, it's a tenth season. Goodness, and it's it's crazy. In, obviously, Audi are an incredible company and amazing motorsport history. Um, and in the Audi Sport team, you know, particularly Le Mans is where they've really excelled in the last twenty years or so. And of course, with drivers like Alan McNish and Tom Christensen. Um, during your time as an Audi driver, have, have you had been able to spend much time with them? And is, has there been anything you can, can learn from people like Tom and Alan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Audi was always, it was really a family, and it still is. Um, because you spend so much time um, with all the team members, 
it it is always a second family. And uh, with Ella, Ellen, with Tom, with Indo Capello, with all the boys, I mean, we had uh, the fitness camps together. And um, yes, there is always an exchangement. They uh, do a, still, they do a lot of events. They join our TT races. We see them often at events, uh, PR events, and uh, it's always great fun. You need, I mean, it always happens. Sometimes you have, sorry to say, bad teammates. Sometimes you have really oh, good teammates. Okay. You can <laughs> learn a lot. Yes, it happens. But um, that, that's what, that, that's the business. I mean, you have to deal with it. And um, within the Audi family, I have to say, I've learned a lot. Um, getting into, involved in the DTM program was not easy. It was definitely not fun. Um, it was crazy, a lot of work. But I have to say, um, in these two years in DTM, I have learned so much. Um, there, I really had good teammates. They have learned me a lot. And this helped me then for afterwards for all the GT programs, definitely. And of course, in DTM, particularly at that time when you were there, it was incredibly competitive with so many factory cars and factory drivers. And uh, I, I saw one clip earlier on today of you um, having a good, um, a good battle with Andy Prio in the BMW. Do you remember that one? Oh, Valencia. Yeah, it's my favorite day. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it was a good one. But as I said, it was tough. Unfortunately, you know, I was winning races in the German um, Formula 3 um, before I get um, in contact with Audi. So I thought, hey, I'm a good racer. I'm a really good driver. And now I have the opportunity to race in DTM and for sure I will be fast as well. I can compete with guys like Matthias Ekstrom, who was already in DTM like for forever and um, honestly I, I can say today I was I was just stupid I didn't know anything about the business how it really works and um, yeah I had one test day and then we uh, immediately went to Hockenheim for the first race when I had the wow. chance to go back to that time I would definitely ask for at least five up to ten test days but you know you just get and take or you just take what you get and um, getting such an opportunity on that time was, was simply amazing. And I'm really always um, grateful for that chance I got uh, from Audi, definitely. And what, so, so many drivers go to the DTM and have the same kind of um, opinion of it. You know, it's always been such a, a deep category with so many competitive cars and competitive drivers. But it, is it is the car, the DTM car itself that you drove, was it? A particularly um, different car to the others that you've been used to or did your single seater experience help is it what, what is it about a DTM car that's so difficult to challenge for so many drivers um, it's not only the car I mean the car is quite close to a, a to a single seater car so doing mm -hmm. single seater before just it's it's definitely better it's closer to a single seater than to a GT car but it's also the surrounding you know you have so many technical meetings you have you have quite like you get a test program. I mean, you you don't only work for yourself. You also work for for the manufacturers. So mm -hmm. sometimes you can't only test whatever you like. So you have a certain program we have to run through, and um, yeah, to adapt to that style of of let's say working, it's 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 quite special. It's 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 really demanding, and um, yeah, it's 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 not always that easy to adapt that quickly. In my opinion. You need two years to adapt, and then hopefully you can you can drive for success. But yeah, you don't always get that chance to do um, more than two years or whatever. So um, you just once again you take what you get, and uh, you have to make the best out of it. And, and but I, it's it's not easy to adapt. And of course, the opportunities that came after that with Audi, you've, you've had so much success since that time in the DTM. So did that provide then the basis to have all the success you've had in in sports car racing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't, I, I didn't really had the, the sportive success uh, within the DTM, but I got to know the business really, really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, first you have to build up the contact, you have to get to know a brand really well, you have to get to know the right people. I mean, as a race driver, it, it's it's really it's strange, but it is how it is. It's you you're not only a race driver who really um, always has to perform on track, as I said early on. The main work is you have to do beside the track. Um, you have to be your own manager. You have to make uh, good deals. You have to 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 speak well with with the teams um, to get the perfect ride, to get the perfect people behind you. Um, you have to make um, them believe in you, and um, yeah, you also have to do a lot of politic 
um, this, this is the main work. And uh, as I said, within these two years, I have learned a lot. And this was my base to, to, to survive so long in, 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 in the T-sports, t- definitely. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, speaking of putting deals together, you have a, a very exciting project with the Iron Dames with Michelle Gatting and Manuela Gossner. And you had a great season last year with a couple of podiums in the ELMS. But coming back to Le Mans this year, tell us about the Iron Dames, what your uh, what your program is about and what your ambitions are for the team. Um, yeah, it, this is an amazing opportunity. And um, I would say this represents also the, the, the trend in motorsport. Right now, I think it's quite trendy to have an all-female team. Mm-hmm. Um, we get more and more support, that's for sure. And um, also the Iron Dames, it's um, it's important or our target is to represent all strong women. I mean, every woman, we say every woman can be an Iron Dame. It yeah. um, doesn't yeah. matter what you do, um, what you work. It's just always keep believing uh, in yourself and, and always work hard. And um, we are lucky, the three of us, to represent this uh, the Iron Dames. Um, together with Deborah Meyer, she um, is the founder of Iron Dames. She's a racer herself, and um, she said that, look, we just need to support each other to get uh, more awareness, to get even stronger, and she was absolutely right. And I think, in my opinion, that's a key factor. Not all female racers um, within our business understand that we need to support each other. Yes. Unfortunately, we are quite a few competing on this high level, but the rivality uh, in between um, each other, it's, it's, I can tell you, it's really, really high. And um, yeah, th- th- this shouldn't be because we need uh, each other's support to, to get even stronger. You always get the chance on track or off track to, to prove yourself, to mm-hmm. prove um, that you're better than your teammates. But um, you have to be clever enough to wait and to to see when this opportunity comes and then you have to take it. But um, beside that, we have to support each other. Really, really important. Is, and of course, to, I, 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 um, at Daytona this year, I interviewed Wayne Taylor, who, of course, the, they went on to win the race outright. And he said when he looked for his drivers, he says it's very important that to get drivers in the car who aren't trying to beat each other. Is that tricky when you're in sports car racing and you're sharing the car with teammates? Is it tricky to, um, you know, control that part of your brain? Obviously, you're a racer and you want to be the fastest on the track. Is that is that tricky to get into that mindset to work work together when you're actually three of you in the car on a 24 hour race? Oh yes, definitely. But um, you know, I mean, it's easier with a little bit more experience. Um, mm-hmm. You get more and more calm. That that's for sure. Um, in the end, we always want to be the fastest, but this is not how it works. This is not how a 24-hour race works. I mean, I know exactly, or every one of us knows, we need our teammates. We can't win a race um, only for, for us, by ourselves. We need the mechanics, we need uh, the physios, um, our engineer. We need every single one in, in, the, in the team. That, that's really, really important. And yes, having more experience is definitely easier to understand. And this is also why um, it works really well with within our Iron Dames project, but also it worked really, really well um, at Daytona for the 24-hour um, with Catherine, Christina and Tatiana, because um, uh, I think Catherine and I, we, we have a similar um, life experience so far, I would say. Mm-hmm. Tatiana was the youngest one. Um, Christina also, she um, a double IMSA champion, a lot of experience. I mean, everyone found exactly um, his position or her position in, in, the, in the team. And that, that's also a really important part. Everyone is, let's say, responsible for something. And um, then it, it, it works well together. So that that experience, um, you know, you when you went to Daytona for the first time for the Rolex Twenty Four, like you say with Catherine, Christina, and Tatiana. Now the the car, um, you were just so unlucky. The car didn't run uh, to to plan and had some technical issues. And during in the middle of the night, it's dark, it's cold, and the car gets brought back to the garage to get repaired. And it's obviously you're the mo- one of the more experienced drivers in the car. 
how how do you not only keep yourself motivated but your teammates motivated when the car is in the garage being repaired and uh, all the other cars are going around the track how what what do you do to to try to keep everybody upbeat yeah the point is it's a really really bad feeling for mm-hmm. everyone but you know that the mechanics they work so well they work so hard so yeah. quickly in that time um you have to stay motivated just um for them because mm-hmm. when you give up as a driver they will give up as well so that's also one rule you will never ever give up and I've, i follow it even it's hard i mean you can see probably if you lose one lap two laps up to three laps okay you somehow hope okay we can still make it but then losing too many laps you realize okay no uh, unfortunately we, we're not going to make it but once again we won't give up i mean the mechanics they have worked so hard also the engineer the whole crew um it's a, always a really really big effort so we just we try to keep on going and make the best out of it we we go for some fast lap times that we can say hey look um we can do our job as good as every, everyone else. We are fast. And in the end, that's that's the most important um, stuff, that we are um, competitive enough, that we are fast, that we are unlucky. That's just, unfortunately, part of racing. And mm-hmm. we have to deal with it. And I guess with en- it's, it's one of those particular challenges of endurance racing as well, is that you're never, you're never out of it until... Uh, until the car eventually says no. <laughs> or, yeah, or, exactly. Or until, like, until like it, it's never done until you have fin- across the finish line. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why uh, for me, motor racing, it's it's not only a physical thing or it's really, it's a mental thing. When you're mentally strong, you can, uh, you're, in my opinion, you're really competitive. Yeah. You have to be clever to understand what's going on, taking a quickly decision. And um, so for me, motorsport is a mental thing. Well, while, while we're on the topic of that, let's let's talk about that because last year you won your class at the Nurburgring twenty four hour race, which I think is the hardest race in the world, even just to finish, let alone win, with so many different speeds of car, so many different standards of driver. Um, tell us from a driver's perspective what the unique challenges of that were, but also last year following on just one week after uh, Le Mans. I mean, how, how did you manage that? <laughs> Yeah, it was a crazy one, but uh, <laughs> we will have the same situation this year again when the t- when the races will take place. What yeah. I really hope for. Um, yeah, th- this was crazy, and honestly, after the second weekend at the Nordschleife, I was done. I was definitely done. It's really tiring, just for your body. Not really. I mean, not not only for for the for your head, for the mental part, because you know when you have targets. I mean. In between these races, you have um, you're so pumped with adrenaline, you forget about uh, how tired you are. Um, it's just that's why we do a lot of work um, during the winter season, or I hope that everyone does because um, <laughs> doing endurance races, it's just about uh, being fit enough. Because when you can keep the concentration high, uh, when you don't get um, tired easily in the car. Um, then the risk is much much lower to do to do mistakes and doing a 20 or to succeed in a 24 hour race it's all about not doing too many mistakes or hopefully not doing any mistakes at all so um, I can say yeah, that I always I was always fit um, I not really I'm not the, the strongest one having crazy mass of muscle unfortunately but um, yeah I'm fit and that's why uh, I didn't struggle that much and you know when it's a long race, a 24-hour race, especially on the Nordsch life. Uh, so many traffic, a lot of traffic, a lot of cars, changeable weather conditions. So that's never easy. But the main task, again, is always to stay focused, not doing any mistakes. And uh, we just had a brilliant um, a brilliant car, a brilliant team. And somehow, somehow we made it. That, this was definitely a cool thing. But... It was already a first step, winning the SP8 class, but, you know, for in the end, it's always SP, uh, SP9 class is what counts at the Nordschleife. It's like, um, it's like the pro category in Le Mans. Yes. You always aim to, to drive in the big category. So um, this year, um, our gentleman racer in the team, he bought a, a new TT3 car, and uh, we're going to compete in the SP9 class. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah, Is there much, much difference between the SP8 and the SP9? The uh, yeah, 
I mean, you are limited um, because you can, in the SP8, you can work on the bodywork. It's uh, the, the older generation of cars. Okay. Um, it's, uh, you can, uh, you are more free to, let's say, to, to fine tune, uh, to play with, uh, with, with tires. And um, with, the, um, with the new generation, you are just, uh, you have more BOP. That's that simple. Ah, okay. And what what is your um? The, everybody has an opinion on BOP balance of performance, and where for our listeners, you know, where you have to change the, you try to make every car the same. What is uh, what is your opinion of this uh, this technique or this method? Yeah, I mean, once again, there are always two sides. One sure. side <laughs> is from the manufacturers or from the driver side. I mean. The manufacturers, they uh, invest uh, a crazy amount of money, um, a lot of time, a lot of effort just to have the best car, the fastest car. And then uh, on the organizer side, um, also from the spectac uh, spectators um, side, it's not interested or definitely less interesting when we always have the same brand winning, uh, winning races, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So mm -hmm. to have more action on track, they just thought of having a BOP and um, yeah, let, let's fight more on track. And I can fully understand that aspect. And um, it got better. And be I would say the BOP got better and better every year. So like SRO, um, ADSC, GT Masters, um, every brand can be really uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. um, you have always some, some tracks where you are more on the lucky side. So I would say today I'm quite happy with the BOP. I can fully understand both aspects and um, we definitely have more action on track with BOP. That's for sure. Oh, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I just love the variety it gives for GT3 racing. You can have so many different brands of car and different types of car Absolutely. racing. I think that's very important for manufacturers and for the, the, the fans watching too you're right now you, you've you obviously you, no, you also spend, sorry, also for on. custom racing yeah sorry mm -hmm. about also for custom racing i think that's a really important point because we already see right now there is a movement in in the in the motorsport business and um probably we will have some manufacturer pulling out of different programs so mm -hmm. i would say uh, custom racing is getting more and more important so therefore we we still need bop also to have um smaller teams um yeah to let them have a chance to compete against the bigger ones and of course with the, i think that you know the global gt3 category of sports cars is great because if you're a a car owner your car still has quite a lot of value on the second hand market because you can race it in so many different racings as well and i, I saw for with with audi that um now customer racing is a big part of their business as in you know g g generating revenue rather than just a marketing activity now oh yes absolutely mm -hmm. uh it's getting bigger and bigger i mean unfortunately they just um yeah, the, the the manufacturer program will get smaller and smaller because they just uh, announced that they will stop uh, with uh, with the DTM at the end of this season. Mm -hmm. um, so a long history once again ends and it opens the door for, for new business and this uh, really seems to be customer racing. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy for Audi Sport customer racing that uh, they can grow. Yeah, I keep the fingers crossed for them. Me too. Yeah. Well, looking, just want to look back a little bit. The last time, um, or sorry, the first time you went to Le Mans in 2010, you drove and what I think is one of the most special looking race cars ever, the Ford GT, GT1. What was it like driving this car at Le Mans for the first time? Yeah, this was an amazing car. <laughs> I I have the same opinion. It's a, it's a really really good looking car still, um, and it had a it had a really brilliant painting, dark and uh, mm -hmm. dark and bright blue. It was a beautiful car. Unfortunately, we got the car really really late, and the team was really nervous. We um, we were in Le Mans and not even having all the spare parts, and um, so it was really really difficult um, just to. To, to try it at the limit, we um, did one preparation race or two, I think Spa and uh, Bruno, they had an accident uh, with, with the car in, uh, I think it was Abu Dhabi or Dubai, I can't really remember. And um, yeah, everyone, everyone was really, really nervous um, that we, we can make it throughout the race and throughout the, the test sessions already. So yeah, honestly, um, the, the level of stress was really, really high. 
Mm-hmm. Um, also for us being the first time in Le Mans, everything was new, the procedures, so many people. It was amazing, but it was a lot of stress. And unfortunately, um, looking back, I would say this was my my worst racing experience ever, that weekend, that first weekend in Le Mans. Unfortunately, wow. because okay. um, we had some difficulties um, in between teammates. The rivality was was crazy. Um, we were as well an uh, all-female team. And this was not a nice experience, unfortunately. Oh, not dear. at all. So this is what yeah. you were talking about earlier when you have good and bad teammates. You know, yeah, is... exactly. So... Exactly. This was a part <laughs> of it because we fight it for all, for every single set of new tires. You can use it. Who can do qualifying? It was it was stupid because uh, we were still young. We were fighting crazy for our position in the team. Mm-hmm. And this is not how endurance racing works. No. And you so, just wanted to drive this great car as well, obviously, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it, it didn't really work out. Not um, not on track and not off track because um, we somehow made it through qualifying. And then uh, we started the race. But we already, after the first pit stop, after the first refueling, um, we had issues. The car didn't uh, restart. No one uh, knew why exactly. So we lost already half an hour in the pit. And then suddenly it restarted. And... Then we had a fuel leak, the car caught uh, fire and it was, um, yeah, it was really, really stressful from the start till to the end, unfortunately. Yeah, mm-hmm. it oh. uh, t- didn't take a, a nice end for the team, not for us, unfortunately. Yeah. So last year, finishing the race in the Ferrari with the, with the Iron Dames must have been a, a nice sort of relief, I suppose, to get to the end of Le Mans and have a much more enjoyable experience, I guess. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. Um so I already knew what, what's what's coming up. I mean, the spectators, the amount of spectators was amazing. To be, to be back on track was amazing. Uh, the Ferrari um, 488 is a brilliant endurance car. It's a brilliant car for, for endurance racing. And uh, the team was amazing. So we were really well prepared. We did a lot of test, uh, test sessions. So it was a really, really nice experience. To finish the race was amazing. We were lucky. No rain at all for for once, which was really surprisingly. Um, yeah, it was a brilliant experience. But you know, somehow at the end, we didn't make any mistakes. We had no penalties, not at all. Uh, but only finishing in the top ten, we somehow expected more, honestly. And then you know, the race was done, and then we thought, ah, oh, we should have done better. We should have been faster. So. It was somehow a strange feeling. On one hand, it was uh, brilliant to finish it, but we somehow expected more. And I really hope that we get um, the next chance because we have to be better. We simply have to be faster. The competition within the, um, the GTM class was, was really impressive in Le Mans. And when you're not on speed, when you don't give, let's say, 200%, you're simply, you're simply not on the level. This was really impressive to see. Yeah, even yeah. though you you are successful in ELMS, um, going to Le Mans, it's once again a different story. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can imagine with so so many top cars and top drivers and that things like this. Now we we talked before we went on air. We talked about how you still, even though you're a professional race car driver, a factory driver, traveling all over the world, when you come home, you still have to go to work in the family business. Tell us about the family business. I want and, to. Uh, you want to? Okay, well, tell us I about it. To. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I love to have a daily routine with working. I mean, um, my siblings and any, the, the whole family, I mean, they made it possible. They allowed me to, to go racing, to let me start in go-karting. Uh, this was not always easy. I mean, my siblings, they had hobbies too. My sister was a musician and um, they spent a lot of, of time as well, uh, not being home. So... It, this wasn't always easy for the family then always to to find the foundation to find uh, the sponsorship it was really really tricky and um our mama she hates motorsport honestly oh, okay. she didn't <laughs> like it at all so for her i had to do a level i had to do well in school otherwise i was not allowed to go go karting at all and um somehow i was or let's say today i'm really really thankful because um she she really showed me that yeah, it's it's important to have a passion to really go for it, but there is also something else in life that matters. And um, I've 
I, I would say that always working back home, helping out as often as I can, really give me a good foundation. I'm, I'm always trying to be really respectful. I know to, to deal with teams, to speak with, with my team members, to always fully accept them. And um, yeah, this, this, like, it's kind of thinking long term. Um, this helped me to survive so long in, in, in that uh, GT world. Yeah. So you have your, your two passions, your driving and also your, your family business as well. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I used to work for my yeah, father, you know. but uh, the only uh, I, I'm an only child, so I didn't have to uh, I didn't have any other brothers or sisters who could do it. <laughs> what what was he doing? What was your family well, business? We, we, we used to have a company selling Scotch whiskey. Oh, is, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, it was it was great because uh, he's been in the business 43 years. So I had the best teacher. Wow. So that yes, exactly. Yeah, that, yeah that, exactly. that was really nice. And uh, yeah, going around the world selling Scotch whiskey was was, was great. Mm-hmm. Um, now, and in Switzerland, your motorsport was banned for such a long time, you know, since 1955. It still all, is. Yes. It, still, it still is. OK, so. Did that make it difficult for you building your career, given that there was no uh, local motorsport, basically? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, but it's still surprising because we have uh, a lot of international or let's say a lot of Swiss drivers, mm-hmm. um, which are pro drivers right now uh, traveling uh, all around the world. Um, yeah, but we, we are allowed to have Swiss championships, but the races are, um, let's say, in France, Italy and um, Germany. Mm-hmm. But um, um, we don't have racetrack. It's not allowed. Uh, racing is still forbidden. We are allowed to have um, hill climb races, which is crazy because they are so fast. And yes. um, going up, and it's, it's, it's impressive. Anyway, um, yeah, it, it wasn't easy, especially to find the foundation in Switzerland because, you know, motorsport, when you can't follow the sport, Um, you can't really offer sponsorship possibilities. You can't, um, or it's always a bigger effort to bring the sponsor to the races Mm -hmm. um, because they have to travel. And this was never easy, but it somehow helped because you knew exactly, hey, you have to get um, out of your country. You have to get in contact um, globally quite quickly. Otherwise, you don't have a chance to do anything um, professional. Absolutely. So it was tough, but um, it also somehow helped because um, you learn to fight quite quickly. That's that's the only point. There's a good yeah. grounding. Yeah. And, and on that yeah. subject about racing internationally, you know, in your time at Audi, you've enjoyed a lot of success racing in Asia. Tell us about the, the differences of racing over there. And also, would you say that it's a good path for drivers to, to develop their career in, in Asia? Yes, absolutely. It is. I mean, it, this that I do a lot of racing in Asia just happened. Somehow, um, I, I'm really good uh, with dealing with customers. So mm-hmm. I think that's why also I survived for 10 years with Audi Sport Custom Racing. I'm just really good on supporting new teams, mm-hmm. um, developing the setup, uh, ex- ex- explain the new car to them, just... Um, I, I would say I'm, I'm a really good team player. I know exactly what the customer needs. I can listen to them. I, I, I always try to support others. So this is why I got to Asia, actually, because Audi China, they needed support. They have built up um, a cup with the Audi R8 LMS car. Mm-hmm. And um, they just needed a professional um, driver to, to coach all the gentleman drivers, all the new clients. And... I was there. I was ready for a new challenge. I'm always uh, up for for new challenges. So Audi sent me to to China, and um, I, yeah, I, I once again I tried to support the, the clients, doing a good job, uh, coaching them, and um, this is what happens. Uh, but Asia also throughout the years it got bigger and bigger. It got uh, really more competitive each year, and um, getting more experience over in Asia helps um, helps every driver it's as more mileage you can do it in the in the car is better it is it's definitely um cheaper to find uh, to find a right uh, a ride over there but uh, on the other hand you have the travel costs so uh, i would say it's 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 quite equal equal but um it's not media wise they don't follow it that much so you can let's say fly a little bit under the radar 
when you don't have built up a, a name yet. This is uh, this is definitely a positive point. And I hope how do you fly your business class out all that way? Not Did at you? the beginning. No? Not at the beginning oh because <laughs> I mean this was just a deal with Audi Audi China and okay. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, luckily once again, first you have to build up your name. You have uh, <laughs> you have to uh, you have to work for 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 your business flights and yeah, in the end we made it. Um, yeah. We are allowed to fly business all what's uh, longer than six hours. Yep. Ah, so it's mu that's much more comfortable in business class. You have a glass of champagne. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As well. <laughs> I mean, uh, for the for the important races, but when you stay a little bit longer, I mean, you get used to 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 traveling. It's it's a lot of travel. So, in the end, you are just. I was always uh, happy and lucky when I made it home safely. This yes. was all what matters to me. And once again, I think you have to be really open. To survive in that business, in the TT business, um, you you have once again you have to take what you get, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you just have to make a deal. Okay, you don't fly uh, business, but you you are hopefully on the fastest car. You are um, you can get a job in the fastest team. So then you go for that option. Mm -hmm. and there is no question about that, and this is exactly. Um, in my opinion, not many um, drivers understand that motorsports is, is a real business. I mean, even though you are, um, you're a pro driver, even though you are a factory driver, you have to find your own job still. I mean, you, have, um, you still have to, to speak with different teams. You always have to ask for new rights. Um, if you don't do so, your teammate will do so immediately. So, yeah. That's fascinating. It's... I didn't realize that. I would thought they'd just say, Audi phone you and say, oh, Rahel, you're going to Japan today or you're going here. So you have to go and make the deals and say, OK, yeah, I'm going to drive for this customer this year. Yes, for 50 ah. percent. But for the wow. rest, um, it, it's up to you. It's, wow. it's, it's up to you. Yeah, but this makes the difference for we have also Marcus Winkelhaar, Christopher Hase. They um, they are also with Audi for so many years, um, nearly as many as I am, and uh, we are just the ones who on this the, the the business case. I mean, when there is a new team, yes, they will call Audi and ask Audi, hey, who you who who you will send uh, to support us? But maybe you can be fast and already call the team and say, hey, I will be the one, <laughs> and that that's how the business is there. I mean, when you want to keep on going, you have to work for, and so they, I like it a lot. Yeah. So when they see your your uh, name pop up on their phone, they know why you're calling. They, they, if they've just bought a new car, yeah, they know exactly. they say, I want to drive your new car. <laughs> 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 cool. Well, yeah. final, final question, and this is a question I ask all my, my guests, and it's a little bit of uh, um, like a, a kind of fantasy question. So you basically, you have the choice. You can choose any race, you can do it in any car and with any teammate. So Catherine, your teammate, she chose uh, the uh, V8 supercar at Bathurst. Uh, so you can have any car you want in with any teammate in any race. What would you choose? Yeah, that's a really difficult one. <laughs> that's a really difficult one. And I have to say, Catherine's choice is a really good choice. <laughs> It's a really good choice, but um, I feel lucky because I've done so many races. I even have done Bathurst. This was mm -hmm. always um, on my list. I was able to do Le Mans already. I just somehow still missed a big race in um, in the States. I mean, I was able to do Daytona this year, but we didn't finish. We um, retired. This was really unlucky. So I need to, to get back to America, to the States. That's, that's for sure. But oh, to name a big race... I don't know. Which, I really don't know. Which car? What would be the ultimate car that you'd love to drive or race? Uh, uh, for sure. Um, when I get the possibility, I, I would do a Formula One race. Ah, okay. Which which track? Greg, getting back to single seaters. Um, good question. Probably Sao Paulo. Ooh. I love that one. Or Austin. Austin must be amazing as well. Yeah, it's that huge long straight. This must be very fast. <laughs> yeah. Very, very fast. Because I have done uh, A1. I was a Friday driver for the Team Switzerland in, in A1. And I was mm -hmm. um, once driving in Mexico and um, Malaysia. It was amazing. It was amazingly fast, but without any preparation. I mean, you know, getting or being a TT driver, you get a 
I always say we get a kind of lazy, we get a kind of laziness because a TT car is so heavy, the movement all happens mm -hmm. really, really slow. And um, then getting back into single seater cars, this is always, it's still one of the most amazing things. So if I get the chance to drive once a single seater again, I will take it immediately. So um, yeah, I can fully understand caffeine um, choosing the V8, <laughs> but I would choose either Formula One or um, really doing Le Mans once again. And once again, it's amazing how uh, most and of the people ask. A, Sorry, go on. In in the in the prototype class, I would dream to, ah, to do so. In the pro in the LMP one, would be amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, they are special special things. So it's funny that I interviewed the uh, the Taylors, Wayne Taylor and Jordan and Ricky, mm -hmm. and they all said Le Mans. One said, uh, one said, I think Ricky said the Ferrari triple three, and Jordan oh, wow. chose the Porsche nine six two. And uh, Wayne, he chose the Audi diesel, the R10, and they chose yeah, okay. uh, Tom Christensen and Alan McNish, they chose. <laughs> so they're very competitive, obviously. No, you know, <laughs> I, I think we, we, we have, as teammates, we have to choose, um, we have to choose um, female, um, female racers. So mm -hmm. Catherine is always a good option. I mean, the, the Quattro we had, uh, I call it Quattro, uh, the Quattro we had uh, in Daytona was amazing. So... Uh, I would go with uh, with a girl from from that squad. What we had in Daytona. Uh, do you know? She Definitely. said exactly the same. Catherine said the same. She said, uh, "I'm going to go V8 at Bathurst with any of my current teammates." So you both have the same answer. You Amazing. Must have, you must have talked with Amazing. one another before. You so you have to say this. <laughs> no, we just had a really good time uh, in Daytona. This is what it is. It's uh, it was amazing. And I hope we can uh, repeat it some someone again. Yeah. I really hope so. I really hope so. You deserve the deserve the opportunity. Well, Rahel, thank you so much for for making the time to come on the the program. Now, but before I let you go, where can people see you on track? First of all, when we get back racing again. Um, we will um, start in July, mid of July, in uh, Paul Ricard Le Castellet with the European Le Mans series. Um, together with my Iron Dames uh, teammates. And then uh, at the end of July, we will be back in the Nürburgring Nordschleife for um, the VLN for the endurance races. Fantastic. No, uh, that's a pretty serious track to get get back racing again. It's uh, Yeah, that's um, that will be very, very, very exciting. Rahel, thank you so much for coming on. We love on. challenges. This is what <laughs> uh, keeps us going. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for coming on. And I, I wish you all the very best for uh, for your season. Same for you, Peter, and same to everyone. Take Thank care. You. Thank you very much. Bye, Thanks Rachel. very much. Goodbye. Ciao, 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 Peter.